Thank you. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome. It's a full is, uh, so yeah, the room is fully packed. It's good to see that. Good to see people are interested in the compositor. So yeah, let's get started. Um, yeah, my name is Habib. I'm a contributor to Blender. I've been doing it as a volunteer for a while now. And today I'll be talking about how the compositor has been completely redesigned. So first I will highlight uh, the top three features that I think are the coolest features that came into the compositor in the last years. And then I'll go into the technical details about the backends and I will focus in this talk on the GPU, but briefly introduce the CPU backends. And of course I will have um, a small teaser about what's coming up next. All right, um, so I guess this is not news to you, but by far the most important feature that came in last year was the viewport compositor. Um, so we now really have the ability in Blender to do lighting and compositing at the same time. Here I'm showing the demo of um, how color correction is being made while the light source is being rotated. Uh, something really unique and really, really cool. And it's been improving ever since. Um, the second cool feature I would like to highlight, this is very recent, this will be in uh, the latest uh, Blender version, uh, which is the multi-pass compositing. Um, basically, this, is, um, this will allow us to do uh, more cool effects like the, the roughening of the edges here, even if the edges are on a uh, non-flat surface and even if the camera is uh, rotating. Um, yeah, that's the before and after and that's pretty cool stuff. Um, the last feature I wanted to highlight is the new CPU backend, which is uh, much, much faster. So in for uh, 0.2 LTS, we're up to 10 times faster, so three to 10 times faster for complex uh, filters, uh, which is thanks to um, a new completely, uh, yeah, CPU backend. So yeah, having said that, like these are the cool features, now let's, let's call to go to the, uh, backends like the, the technical details now. And for that, I would like to first introduce the code structure, how we structure Blender now. Um, so at the very top, we have the compositor node tree. This is what users see, basically the graph. And with that, we can either do some sort of um, offline compositing. This is what you used to uh, before the viewport or interpret that in the viewport compositor. Um, and then Below those, we can choose either to do CPU for the offline. Um, there is the so-called tile CPU compositor, which has been there until 4.1. And then there is a new full frame compositor, which has been there since 4.2. Um, and then there is also the real time compositor, which is GPU only. As for the viewport, there is, yeah, for obvious reasons, only GPU. Um, and today we'll be talking about uh, these three below here. So let's start with the tile compositor, which is um, one CPU uh, backend for the offline compositor. Um, even though this is, has been uh, removed, um, so it's been introduced actually in 2012, so really long time ago, and it's been removed in 2024 um, to give way to the full frame compositor. I just wanted to pay tribute to this because it has been so long in Blender, so just a brief introduction of what it actually does. Um, before that, I will just explain the node tree that I'll be using throughout the whole presentation. Uh, I'll be using this image and a relatively simple tree where I will just uh, do exposure compensation and then convert the image to black and white and then scale it down a little bit. Um, so we will be having this as a final result and I'll be going through all the backends, how they actually come to this result. All right, um, for the tile compositor, we start with an empty canvas. Um, and as the name suggests, we only look at the a tile of the input image. And this is what we're doing here. Um, we look at the input image and only extract one little tile. And then we process that tile. We apply the exposure compensation only on this tile. Again, uh, black and white only on this tile. And also even for scaling, we only scale within that tile. And then we view it. And then we go to the next tile. Uh, we do our, we go across uh, the whole node uh, setup again, do the scaling and so on. So. In, um, yeah, in some, it will look something like this. This is how the tiled compositor approaches the, the node and it slowly builds up uh, the whole image while processing the whole node, tile by tile. Um, the full frame compositor, in contrast, 
course, completely differently. So for context, um, yeah, this is in use. This has been released in 4.2, but it has been around for, for a while now, a couple of years in development almost. Um, and the way it works is, as also the name suggests, uh, is to start with the full frame first. So if I have an input image, I look at it, all of it, and then I process the next node for the whole image. Um, again, if I want to do black and white, I process the whole image uh, for scaling also. And yeah, even if the, the idea is relatively simple, it gives us a significant speed up here. Uh, of course, I have to say the details are much more complex under the hood with multi-threading and all the corner cases and so on. Uh, but the basic idea is, is, uh, is to look at the whole image at once. Um, and yeah, the, the numbers, what I've shown so um, in the couple slides ago, they refer to the tiled compositor and the full frame compositor. So yeah, that's a brief introduction of the CPU uh, part. Now I would like to go to the GPU part, which will be the focus of this talk. Um, so yeah, historically it's been introduced in 3.5, but not with full support. So only recently we have now 100% support of all the nodes and um, so now we can really advertise it. Um, there are a few concepts that I'd like to introduce first before we go through how the GPU compositor actually interprets, interprets the um, graph node. Um, most importantly, the, the, con the domain size, um, this evaluation of schedule and compiling, but also the cache manager. Um, I will not talk further about the cache manager. As the name suggests, it's just there is caching in the system. Um, so let's start with the domain. Um, we have the new addition here with the new compositor is that we are compositing in an infinite virtual compositing space. What this means is if you add an image to the compositing space, uh, the image is by default centered, um, but there is no limits as where it, uh, it should be, like how, how large it should be or so on. And this also has another consequence. So if you do some sort of transform, nothing gets cropped or, or anything, you, your space is infinite. Um, but we also have the new concept of representing operations through two things. So the image resolution is one thing and the transformation is another thing. So you can notice here, even though the image is skewed and transformed, it still has the same resolution. And last but not least, we have uh, the concept of realization. So once I do want to render or once I do want to go to the next operation, which is in this case, uh, the composite node, um, then I have to project my domain onto the domain of the, um, yeah, of, of the input operation. Um, and this gives us the final result. So the cropped or the stretched or, or whatever. Um, pretty straightforward, I hope. Uh, but it's important to understand how <laughs> the compositor works. And now we can actually go into the details of how the graph node is being interpreted. So the first thing we will look at is the scheduler, which has the main goal of um, looking at the node graph, and then it produces a schedule out of it, which means which node should be yeah, interpreted in which order. Uh, so this is our goal would be to, to get a schedule like this. The algorithm is called uh, post-order depth first traversal. Um, sounds a bit complex, but it's actually quite simple. Um, and I'll go through the, algorithms, the algorithm really quickly now. So we start with the output node uh, and we start with an empty schedule. And then ask ourselves at the output node, do I have any dependencies on this node? The question, so the answer is here is um, yes. Um, there is something linked there, so I have to consider that first. So I go to the scale node, ask ourselves, are there any dependencies there? Yes, so I need to go further, but the question is where? And um, the goal here in the next step is to minimize the amount of intermediate buffers with the idea that if all buffers are roughly the same size, then, and I minimize the amount of intermediate buffers, then I will minimize the peak memory while I'm uh, executing my graph node. And this is the reason why, so let's have, yeah, this in more detail. So the sub, subgraph A would have here three intermediate buffers, uh, like one, two, and three, whereas the subgraph B will have only one. 
So let's start with the subgraph with the most amount of intermediate buffers in order to, in sum, minimize the amount of um, intermediate buffers in the, in the whole graph node. Um, yeah, and so we continue with the same questions, like do I have some dependencies? Yes, so we go to the next node. Do I have dependencies? Yes, we have to the next node. Notice how our schedule so far is still empty. We, we still don't know where to start. Uh, but here, is, this is the first node that we meet that doesn't have any dependencies. So we say, oh, actually, I can evaluate this one. So I add it to my schedule, and then we trace back. Okay, let's go back to, to what we saw. Do, are all the dependencies resolved? Yes. So let's add them to the schedule. And so on, we trace back again. And now we go to the part where we did not uh, go through, it's the subgraph B, but the algorithm is the same. Like, do I have dependencies? No, so let's add it to our schedule. And so on, until we come back all the way to the node and until we have a finalized schedule. So now we know how to execute nodes and in which order. All right. Um, so far, we did not evaluate the nodes themselves. We only know which order we have to go to. And this is where the second step, compile and evaluate, comes in, uh, where it, its goal is to convert the nodes into operation stream and then actually evaluate them. So I would like to introduce a few concepts before we just go through the algorithm. The first one is the notion of having a pixel operation and a node operation. We differentiate between these two. So roughly speaking, we say the pixel operation is an operation where I only need to know the, um, the value of the pixel I'm looking at without having to look at its neighbors or uh, like in filters or in, in scaling like pixels very far away. Um, everything else is a node operation. Um, the second or the third concept I'd like to introduce is the, uh, the pixel compiled unit. Uh, this is the concept that lets us um, compile two pixel operations into one. So before I execute them, let's say if there are two different shaders, then we compile them into one single shader. And then we interpret them as a single node, so to speak, or a single operation. And this will be very beneficial for performance later on. Um, so yeah, now that we have the concepts in mind, let's look at the actual algorithm. And um, since we have the schedule, we know where to start. So let's look at the, the first node and ask ourselves, is this a pixel node? Well, by definition, the image node is not. Um, so let's evaluate it right away and get the, the image out of the input image. Um, same for the exposure node. Is this a pixel node? By definition, actually, yes. So we add it to the compile unit. Notice how we did not evaluate it yet. And now we go to, to the next node, to the RGB, to black and white, and also ask the same question. Is this a pixel node? Yes. Now we just need to ask one more question. Is it compatible with our compile unit with what we added so far? Um, it can... It may or may not be compatible depending on the, its domain, what I introduced a couple slides ago. So if they really have the same domain, they, um, yeah, the definition will apply, will hold true, and I will only need to know one, the position of the pixel that I'm looking at um, and not the neighbors. So in this case, it is compatible, so I will add it to my compile unit. And um, yeah, I move on with that same ideas and checking if it's um, if a pixel node is um, if, if my node is a pixel node or not so my next one is actually not um, a pixel node and this is where it gets tricky so now i know that i cannot extend my pixel compile unit anymore it, it doesn't make sense so we just compile the uh, pixel compile unit and we also have this advantage of treating them as one single operation together and now if I evaluate them, it will be quite fast because I only evaluated one operation. And of course I have to um, empty my pixel compile unit and keep the process again for what's coming up. Um, for the value, it's not a, a pixel node and the scale is not a pixel node, so I evaluate them right away. Nothing matching happening there until all the end. And now we're done. Now we have really at the very end our nice composed image that I can show in the offline compositor or in the uh, viewport compositor. All right, um, that was the, pretty much the magic behind the uh, 
yeah, the CPU and GPU. And just in case you thought the CPU is fast, the GPU really kills it. It's <laughs> um, so much faster. I only was able to get like 20 to 50 times faster on this machine by tweaking the parameters and everything. Uh, but on a proper GPU, we really expect, yeah, maybe 100 times faster than the baseline, uh, the tight compositor. Um, so yeah, it really works. <laughs> Okay, um, yeah, we're almost done. So for the future plans, um, there's a few things I would like to tease up. Um, first of all, the code that will change quite significantly. We are trying to move from this fairly complicated node structure or code structure to a very simple and unified one. So uh, we will have the real-time compositor, which was here and here as the single backend that will treat the compositor node. Um, and um, currently we only support the GPU. So the idea is to have a CPU backend for the real-time compositor, and then we can unify uh, all, the, all the code. Um, and then we will rename it compositor because there is no difference between real-time or offline. Um, this will give us a few advantages. Um, the obvious one is they will be sharing code since we're reducing the, the complexity. Uh, but the more important one for um, users maybe is we will have the ability to share assets, um, especially between the shader and the compositor. So if you have a texture in your shader editor, you'll be able to use it in the uh, compositor, like something, a complex n noise texture that you made, um, you'll be able to reuse it or some math nodes as well. And we actually expect even faster CPU uh, execution time. Uh, Jack talked a little bit yesterday about this in his uh, geometry notes talk. Um, I'm not covering it, but um, it will be faster. That's all I want you to know. <laughs> um, there is also a big plans for the UI and usability. Um, so for the short term, at least, uh, we're planning to improve the gizmos with the idea that you know gizmos are more intuitive than actually you know tweaking parameters. Um, so we're working on um, making masks going through uh, going towards uh, gizmos and not parameters anymore. Um, there is also the concept of um, being able to select favorites or favorite nodes so that you can view uh, nodes very fast. Um, I have to admit I was hoping to get this done you know, <laughs> before the conference, but um, it will be uh, done very soon, so hopefully for the next uh, release. And last but not least, um, yeah, I wanted to announce that we'll be joining Blender full-time uh, starting next year, so thank you. <laughs> Yeah, my plan is hopefully to accelerate, you know, the rate of <laughs> improvements and, um, yeah, see what we can uh, work on. So I really would like to tell you, you know, to reach out to me, you know, throughout the conference or after. Um, here's my contact, but we also have a VFX uh, artists and uh, studios meeting tomorrow. Um, so please come by if you have anything, you know, concerns about the compositor, what you're missing. Just let me know. I really would love to hear all your stories. Um, yeah, and my slides about the credit, just in case I accidentally uh, took too much credit, this is not all me, so um, I really would love to give credit to Omar for the GPU backend, uh, Manuel, who's not active anymore, but he introduced the idea of full-frame compositor, and of course, Jaron and Monique for uh, working on the tiled compositor that held so long in, in, the, in Blender, uh, Sergey, the one and only <laughs> VFX module owner uh, for all the help with the design and um, reviews, and of course, everyone who contributed to the VFX module, and of course, you. Thank you for listening. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> we might have time for one question. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, the question is, are there multiple ways to scale an image in the, um, um, in the compositor and which ones 
change the domain and which ones do not. So in the CPU backend, we had um, um, more or less a limited, um, yeah, a limited canvas size. So if you scale too much and then scale down again, you might lose some information. Um, the idea with the infinite domain size is it doesn't matter. So from a user's perspective, the node will be treated one after the other. So if um, you will not lose information and it doesn't matter. Right now, there is a small difference between the CPU and the GPU, as I mentioned, but uh, there will be no types of scales or uh, they all do, um, just looking for um, the slide where I mentioned, you know, trans yeah. Um, a transformation is, is represented by its um, image resolution and, and transformation, so no information is getting lost. Yeah. All right, I think that's pretty much it. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.